a very good afternoon each and every one i welcome each one of you to 19th session of this web series i hope you all know that these sessions are being conducted and organized by english language teachers association of india and i also very much sure that you know what it is those who have joined us today for the first time let's have a look what is eltai before we go ahead let me welcome the moderator of the day mr raj kumar singh mr singh is an english language teaching professional and soft skill trainer trainer he is working as an assistant professor in amity school of communication enhancement and transformation amity university lucknow he is secretary of eltai lucknow chapter and he is a recipient of the us federal scholarship to attend classroom exchange program he has been three times awarded the e teacher scholarship by the us department of state and received the certificate of excellence as a teacher trainer for regional english language office embassy of the united states of america mr singh over to you thank you shaban sir good evening ladies and gentlemen before i start the proceedings let me inform you that this event is being recorded 
distinguished academicians, esteemed resource person, Ms. Vicky Hale, our most valued participants from across the world, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Rajkumar Singh, your host for the day. First of all, thanks a lot for showing an overwhelming response. The English Language Teachers Association of India, LTI, is celebrating its 50th anniversary year by organizing web series on different topics related to English language teaching and teacher training. It is my proud privilege to welcome you in the 19th LTI online webinar on reflective teaching practices, self-reflection and learning spaces being coordinated by LTI Lucknow and Greater Noida chapter in association with the Regional English Language Office, Embassy of the United States of America. Before I invite Vicky Hale for conducting the online session, there are a few important announcements for the participants. This event is being recorded and post your questions in the chat box. These will be taken up in the question answer session at the end of the presentation. And now the time has come for which you have been eagerly waiting for. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our resource person for today's online session, Wiki Hale, EL Fellow Alumina, US Department of State. Wiki has been teaching at St. Joseph's College for Women in Vishakhapatnam. She holds an MED in TESOL and World Language Education from the University of Georgia as well as a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. In addition, she has earned a Master's Specialist Certificate in TESOL. Wiki taught ESL for five years in the US to adults at several private language schools where she covered four skills, work integrative language teaching, as well as test preparation and pronunciation work. Today, she will address some questions and issues related to reflective teaching practices. Some of the questions are, what does it mean to practice reflection in the teaching profession? A look at what we have built our lives and careers on and how it influences our teaching approaches and what will make us healthier, stronger, and more creative teachers. What should our classrooms look like in this new normal? How can we strive to make our students autonomous, successful, productive, and lifelong, lifelong learners who contribute to society while practicing these things in our own lives? Over to Vicky Hale for delivering her lecture on reflective teaching practices, self-reflection, and learning spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I want to give you greetings from Vizac. That's where I am at. One little correction about my introduction is that I'm not right now an alumna. I'm an actual um, practicing active uh, virtual fellow for the US Department of State only um, we have to change our program a little bit because of the COVID situation. But I want to first thank El Tai and uh, the Mr. Vice President, Dr. Vice President, and respected office bearers. I want to thank the Lucknow chapter, Mr. Raj Kumar Singh, and especially Ms. Nalina Singh, because she has been so forthright, diligent, and earnest in her work for the teaching profession and also the students that she cares for. And she's the one who first invited me to speak. Uh, she has challenged me numerous times to learn, to grow, and to become a better teacher. So I have been reading the 2020 India education policy, and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful update, and I hope that you're all reading it too. I haven't gotten through it all, but um, there was one particular paragraph in the introduction that I wanted to uh, share with you. Let's go ahead and look at that. I'm just going to take an excerpt from the, from the policy where it says, it is becoming increasingly critical that children not only learn, but more importantly, learn how to learn. 
So this is going to tie in to the end of my presentation today. Education thus must move towards less content and more towards learning about how to think critically and solve problems, how to be creative and multidisciplinary, and how to innovate, adapt, and absorb new material. Pedagogy must evolve to make education more experiential, holistic, integrated, inquiry-driven, discovery-oriented, learner-centered, discussion-based, flexible, and of course, enjoyable. So I hope that today will help you enjoy all of these things that of course you are now setting uh, your hearts toward the future in, but especially this one statement, pedagogy must evolve to make education more experiential. You know, there's a famous uh, educator, John Dewey, who said once, we do not learn from experience. We learn by reflecting on experience. And I know that the last six months has brought for many of you, many of us, the opportunity to reflect, to ponder, to question, and hopefully to move forward. There has never been, I don't think, a better time to look deeply at what we're doing as teachers and where we're doing it, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. I have two objectives today. First, to bring understanding of the reflective teaching practice and reflecting on our own lives, our small story of self. And secondly, I want to move us toward the bigger picture of students in the classroom, um, which I hope will help in developing students who can function well in society, autonomous learners as well as assist in your own professional development. So we're going to start with this first question. What does it mean to practice reflective teaching? How do I deconstruct my life, my background, my assumptions, in order to reconstruct a teaching philosophy that reflects my purpose for teaching? And second, what should our classrooms look like, as Mr. Raj just said, as we navigate a new normal? How do we produce the kind of learners that are necessary for the future? Autonomous learner. I think reflection has a lot to do with that. We'll talk about using reflection with our students, allowing them to reflect on their own learning. And this will help them to look at their learning challenges, to think critically, and to put into practice what they are learning. You know, I never really thought of myself as a structuralist, but then I'm not a psychologist either. But I so believe that we must look deeply at our experiences, learn from them, and build on them, and grow from them. So let's start with the question, what does it mean to reflect? You know, the Latin term reflector means to bend back. So when we look in a mirror, the lights bend back to reveal our image. Something comes back to us. When we reflect on our day or our past, we think deeply and seriously. Something comes back to us. When we reflect um, on our overall experiences, we consider the dimensions and different aspects of something. And we move forward with insight. So what is reflective teaching practice? I know you've heard the words and I know that it's been around at least since the 90s. Because it's definitely opposite idleness, it's opposite ignorance, it's a process. Remember the adage, the journey is as important as the destination. We need to look at our own past, our biases, prejudices, assumptions, and outlooks, what is called autobiographical inquiry. This will come first and give us insight into our own lives that will affect our teaching and our students' lives, not to mention our outlook towards others and authority. I'm going to show you one way of doing this in just a moment. But first, 
I want you to look a little bit more at this definition because it's more than a process. I mean, it is a process. It's more than autobiographical. It's analytical and it's philosophical as we look at our classrooms. And yet it is very practical. We look at our classroom at our lessons and think, was it receptive? How, how could I improve? How could I change something for different students? classes or for different learning outcomes. So we look at underlying principles and beliefs that might be exhibiting themselves from our own past. But there is a third part of this definition. It's a tool for assessment to help our students realize their own learning styles and challenges, successes and obstacles. That is what we call, of course, metacognitive development. And I'm going to speak on that more later. Now, I am going to refer to Mr. Dewey from time to time because there's a model in his philosophy that I want us to look at how he demonstrates a pathway that he undertook to develop his own educational philosophy. I've asked a lot of teachers if they have written out their teaching philosophy, and many have not. But hopefully after today, that's something that you will look at. So uh, Mr. Dewey was the founder, I guess you could call him the founder, of the philosophical movement known as pragmatism. The reality that we, he felt must be experienced. He was also an advocate for progression, progressive education, hey, the hands-on approach not traditional classrooms, but if you read your new uh, uh, education policy of 2020, it speaks a lot about this. Dewey described progressive education as, quote, a product of discontent with traditional education, unquote. He also believed in active learning. In other words, when learners construct and build on their own understanding. Reflective thought, was how he ex, ex, got more out of his own experiences, the consideration of beliefs and practices. So let's attempt to really experience reality because education is life itself. Let's be hands-on in our classroom approaches, be learner-focused and consider all our beliefs and practices along the way reaching the end goal, whatever your end goal might be, in the small story or the bigger picture. Mine is to make autonomous learners who think and reflect with open minds and engaging intellects. Now, I've had help here in India with this. First, by chance, finding two books by author Nirja Raghavan, and then intentionally through one of her classes. She wrote, reflective practice helps one see one's own experience with clarity. It involves skills like the following. So look at my list here. Looking at our own experiences. Systematically looking at various aspects of each experience. Acknowledging strengths and weaknesses of ourselves that surface as we're doing this reflection. Identify areas that need to be worked on and then find ways to resolve these identified problems. Reflection is implementing solutions that have been identifying and staying open to one's own experiences at every stage. It also means evolving one's refined practice from our experiences. She's written two books. Um, she's actually been a part of many more, but the reflective teacher and the reflective learner are two that I'm in the very midst of now. Now, I know that you're not pre-service teachers. Maybe there are a few of you who are, but nevertheless, I want to say, don't be afraid of this idea of reflection. And I want to begin with ourselves, looking at our own experiences. And some have called it 
autobiographical inquiry. Another word might be interrogation of the self, but don't be afraid of that because you're doing it yourself. Somebody else isn't doing it for you. I read a study from 2005 about multicultural education pedagogy, and it showed that pre-service teachers began to see how their own lives were connected to difference. And it made them rethink their own histories and their futures as teachers. Now, Guillory, who reported on this study in her 2012 paper, she actually is a professor at a university from the state that I'm from, Kennesaw University, although I graduated from uh, the University of Georgia. But in her paper, she wrote about the space that she tries to create so that students are able to expose and deconstruct their assumptions. And I'd like to as much as possible today in our short time together to help you to create that space or at least make way for that space. And I'll show you how in just a moment. So interrogation of the self, it's, it's crucial to look at gender and race and caste oppression and or privilege and how it has impacted our daily lives. So the aim is to deconstruct the familiar, to look at our histories, our assumptions and our experiences through this biographical, autobiographical inquiry to move toward deeper understanding of who you are and who you want to become as a teacher, because we're always becoming, right? We never arrive, hopefully we never arrive. And you know, I've, um, you have a personal identity, but you also have a teacher identity, but for sure they're going to intersect. Both will influence your relationships with your students and other people. So I'd like to introduce this exercise that I did back when I was working on my master's. Uh, for a course that I took on diversity. But I have since used it in various classes, even in my class, English for employability, so that students look at their lives and their experiences. And they love this. They love it because they discover so many things, including that it's possible to write a poem. So my poem is called I Am From. Now, the original poem was written um, by someone named George Ella Lyon. And I'm not going to read that for you today. You can find it online, OK, the original poem. But I thought I'd be a little vulnerable and share with you my poem. So here I am. This was back before India, before all the gray hairs. All right. I am from military bases, schools every three years sibling rivalry and differences unnoticed. I am from casseroles and French bread, tacos and black beans, escargot on Champs-Elysees, borscht, pilmini and ploth, ants in my coffee. I am from Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, Janis Joplin and Helen Reddy, I am woman. I am from when in Rome, do as the Romans, do unto others, and never met a stranger. I am from knowing Jesus, always learning, age has no meaning, and all people matter. I am from over half a century of learning from mistakes, worshiping God who gives second chances, a husband and child at 40, new beginnings, new seasons, new chapters unfolding. This is one of my new chapters, by the way. All right, so let me introduce you to this template and you can find this online. If you can't, just email me, all right? But there's a template that you can give your students or that you can use for yourselves that will help you write this poem, will help you to recognize biases, recognize your own frustrations and help you identify prejudice or privilege. These things, affect your teaching both positively and negatively. So this first step is called deconstruction and it's going to help us uncover assumptions and assumptions interfere with our views. 
Assumptions are ideas that we believe to be true. They are also beliefs, not necessarily based on facts. They are also unmet expectations that place undue pressure on other people. And they are off, also often our default thinking. If they're not checked. Yes, in fact, assumption awareness is really the first step in reflection. I think it's the first step in thinking critically. I'm teaching a critical thinking course this term and reflection is actually a part of critical thinking. Um, so uh, uncovering assumptions is very key. We need to reflect um, on these things that we have learned that we discover when we're writing this poem. Now, there are other ways to think about your background. You can do a brainstorming experience. You don't have to do this poem. It's just a, a fun exercise to do. But certainly, I even have, I'll mention it in a little while, students um, just brainstorm every experience that they can think of and then uh, try to look at um, assumptions. So we deconstruct. Now, uh, please keep in mind, deconstruct is not destroy, all right? Deconstruction, after recognizing these assumptions and biases and prejudices or privilege, we allow our interests and our insights to change if they need to be changed, or at least we want to be open to change. So for example, Dewey in 1884, he began by teaching philosophy and psychology but his interests gradually began to shift. So reflect on that, what you have learned and how some of your interests maybe have shifted. So after looking where you came from, think about the changes that have occurred in the last 15 to 20 years. And then imagine a child today and what things will be like in the future. Now, you can just go to the introduction in the first couple pages of your uh, uh, India education policy, and it talks about a lot of those changes. So you don't even have to go through this exercise that I'm going to show you in a minute. But it does help to look at how, how you're what you're preparing your students for, right? And then after you imagine that, I want you to think about your peak learning experience, the people and the environment, what it was like when you were at your best learning, when you really learned and absorbed so much, what, what were the conditions like? And then combined what's needed for the future and your peak learning experience, and then look at your own classroom. Look at your own classroom and think about if your classroom looks like what you want it to look at, look like. Learn to ask yourselves and others good question. You can actually do this in small groups in a staff meeting. I did this in a workshop once when everyone went in small groups. You'll see that picture at the very end. And then question number four, what would learning be like if it were designed around your answers to the first three questions? Is our teaching and our students learning in tune with the demands of our time? and the needs of today's students. Can we integrate these things that we've discovered in a way that still includes the standards and the requirements of our education system? Now you can look deeply at your teaching philosophy. If you come from a different cultural and linguistic background than your students like I do, this is really important, okay? you'll. Guillory called it, let's see if I have this on the next slide. Yes, Guillory called it critical, self, reflexive, multiculturalism. Because we want to look at these things and develop our philosophy into a practice that's based on our values, 
and our principles. But very importantly, we need to connect this with the changing world and society. Let me just give you a, an example from my own life, okay? So my bachelor's degree is in business administration. I used to work with businesses and nonprofits. But when my husband and son and I returned from Russia to the United States, I saw this growing refugee and immigration um, uh, in the US and I love different cultures. And so I decided to go back to school to get my master's degree, but not just in linguistics. World language education afforded me the opportunity to focus on multiculturalism and the benefits and challenges of multilingualism. I guess that's why I got so interested in India. So consider this as you consider your values and your principles. How is our world changing and meeting the needs of the world and society. Dewey also, for example, he continued to develop his progressive pedagogy and he moved on to Columbia University in New York City, which has a, an atmosphere of participation. Um, Columbia is today, and so I'm sure it was back then, um, known for unparalleled diversity and hands-on involvement. And he began to change his whole philosophy and his pedagogy. He said something really important, or now this isn't a quote from him, sorry, this is from Britannica about Dewey's philosophy. The common theme underlying Dewey's philosophy was his belief that a democratic society of informed and engaged inquirers was the best means of promoting human interests. He considered participation rather than representation as the essence of democracy. He was a proponent of student involvement, student interests, driving teacher instruction to keep learner focused. That was back in 1938, by the way. So reflection is a type of engagement because it informs our practices, our attitudes, our outlooks, and our insights. But in the end, it's all a part of our journey toward understanding how our history and our identity will impact interactions with students. Because if we're harboring any kind of prejudices and, you're un and, and maybe there's some even discrimination that you're unaware of in your practices, you're not being fair to your students or your colleagues. Now, after exposure of the self, very often when we're looking deeply, we start seeing things in our system, flaws and weaknesses in our system. But I, I have a word of caution here because I don't believe in uh, being critical without um, having ideas, all right? So um, as we begin to develop and articulate our teaching philosophy, we, we see these things in the system. Um, I don't have time today to talk about um, the underpinnings and the uh, groundwork and reinforcements uh, that our systems, our governments, what, what, in any country, we, we're not going to, it's not the focus of the talk today. But it has been necessary in my country for people to understand the word and the concept of privilege, because privilege is not racism and it is not prejudice. It is an imbalance in our system. It is about injustices. And so even though we won't go there today, you will probably discover it as you look at things. And as you discover them, you'll see how it might be unfair for some of our students. But what I want you to do, um, instead of griping about the, sy the system injustices, think about your classroom. Think about your students and how you can compensate or accommodate in your classroom, just perhaps. Now, the reason you see this picture of a bicycle, just in case you're wondering, is because I learned a lot about the system in my, my country by looking at bike riders. My dad's a bike rider. And the whole system is geared towards drivers in automobiles, not bike riders. And I began to think how the system, whether it's education system or other systems are geared towards the privileged and not the bike rider. So that's um, for another day. 
But as you think about this um, and compensating and accommodating in your classroom, try to understand yourself because that will help you understand your learners, which will help you understand the system, which will help you understand the classroom, which will give you a new perspective and a desire to keep learning. And that was another thing that I saw in your education policy of 2020. Always learning. You know, I see English differently through my learner's eyes than through my own. I found this quote so poignant for these times that we are in. Do we maintain that there is no static being, there is no ch changeless nature, nor is experience purely subjective. Human experiences are the outcomes of a range of interacting processes. The challenge to human life, therefore, is to determine how to live well with processes of change, not somehow to transcend them. I used to not have that quote actually on a PowerPoint, but everyone always asked me for it uh, later. It's a, it's a great quote. We, we want to live well, and in my mind, to live well is to be aware. I think awareness is such a crucial key. And reflection helps us to be aware and helps us then, even when we're not reflecting in the classroom, to be aware. It narrows the gap between theory and practice. So when we practice something, we use instruments, right? It is the means to an end. So instrumentalism is the view that knowledge comes from connecting events. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want you to see different instruments that you can use to help you to connect events, the processes of change. And what do I mean by this? Remember I told you that I often have my students in this English for Employability brainstorm all of their um, experiences, whatever they can think of, no holding back. Consider nothing worthless, I tell them. And then look at those experiences, what you might have learned, what you've enjoyed, how you've grown from that experience, and then relate it to other experiences and see how you might have changed. Something was instrumental or helpful or influential. And that brings us to reflection. Now, this slide was meant to be animated, but Webinar Jam doesn't allow me to animate. So you're seeing it all at once. So sorry about that. That's not the idea of a good PowerPoint slide when you see so many things. But I will try to explain. So first you were to see reflection as professional development along with the light bulb that says idea. OK, um, so maybe that will help you. So reflection is also professional development. It can be considered the goal of reflective practice. So we plan and we learn and we do and we assess. All right. So think of ideas as instruments that we use to help make sense of the world, right? They can be the basis for a plan or a call to action. And it's truly an idea when it produces a result. We learn and we do. Then the assessment measures all the plans and the actions, right? Well, not always. I'd like to turn that assessment into reflection where we deeply look at the results. Now, in looking at the results, my idea is not really new methodology. My idea, my methodology in this process of professional development. I call it trial and error methodology. Now, I'm not going to show you the next slide because that one's not animated either. I wanted you first to see a linear line where I say, is methodology and trial and error methodology linear? Do we begin with awareness and then planning and implementing and assessing and then starting all over? Is that what it looks like? I dare say no. No. All right, I'll show you this slide. No, it's up and down, success and failure, 
all the while reflecting. I reflect every day after my classes. I write down what I, what I did, of course, and if I went according to the lesson plan and what worked and what didn't work and what questions came up. But reflection helps us to make sense of it all and to enjoy the unknowns. So it makes a failure not, even if it was the unknown and it, was, and it seemed like a failure, we reflect and, and maybe we implement something new and it turns into success and we try it with another class, it doesn't go so well. So we reflect on those mistakes and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And we incorporate new ideas and we reflect on the positives and we try other approaches. So it's, think of this as trial and error methodology. All right, reflection as an instrument to see the results, whether negative or positive. You know, maybe the class clams up or maybe it was a bad idea. Or the class got overly excited, but it doesn't produce the result that we want. I remember a time when I wanted my class to uh, beginner class to use adjectives to describe some objects. And instead of describing the object, they instead describe the situations where you would find those objects. So I had to go back to the drawing board and I had to also talk with them about the mechanics and the meaningful uh, activity and then move on again and try communicative in another way. Um, so understanding classroom transactions is another objective of reflective practice. You know, in content areas, we usually focus on transmitting information, you know, science or history or um, however, when the focus is more on languages, I want to focus on growth and development. So trial and error is good because the end result is only a byproduct. Get this, please. The learning is in the process. Does that make sense? I hope. So our reflective practice thus far has been focused on the teacher and the methods. Now I wanna go a step further and I wanna use reflection with the students. So, Niraja Raghavan in her introduction to the compiled and edited book, The Reflective Learner, seeing missed takes in mistakes, wrote an important reminder just in case you've been thinking, all right, my job's gonna go away in this era of artificial intelligence, but she reminds us that teachers will always be needed to facilitate the learning of students. However, our goal is for our autonomous learners to emerge for they will be the winners of the future. It's our duty to help students take charge of their own learning. This is metacognitive development, and we can learn to look at mistakes as opportunities. Missed takes, not to miss those takes, rather than pitfalls. I think it's only half the issue of assisting our students to learn, to learn to learn how they learn. I think it's important to not allow them to compare themselves with others. You know, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, U.S. president back in the early 20th century, he said comparison is the thief of joy. And so we want to look for those mistakes. And we can do that in a number of ways. And Nirja mentioned some in her books, and I'm sure that you have all discovered ways the things that you can do, putting things on a flip chart or on the board and looking at the correct version and then having them identify their own mistakes. A lot of my uh, college students, they'll send me something to read and I'll want to wait, want, right away, I'll want to start correcting their errors. And I'll, if I see a lot, I'll send it back to them and I'll say, I want you to read this out loud to yourself and I want you to listen for mistakes and correct those mistakes and then send it back to me again. So there's all different kinds of ways. Um, we can um, 
that of things we can do in the classroom to help students identify their mistakes. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today, but I want you to remember this idea. Right now, I want to finish with the focus on the student's own reflection. After I do an activity, I'll often say to my students, so what did you notice? I'll let the students ask me, why did you use that activity or think to themselves? Okay, having students reflect on what they've been learning, they can ask any of these questions. Why did the teacher use this exercise? How is this practical? How is it impractical? I've begun to ask many of my students at the end, besides their quiz or their uh, authentic assessment, whatever is the assessment, to write a reflection on what they learned. What was good? What was practical? What was impractical? What did they like? What did they didn't like and why? Don't send me a summary. They want to send me a summary. Well, the teacher taught this and this. No, I want them to ask these questions. And this last idea of portfolios is something that can be done at any age. We just, of course, my some of my master's students just did portfolios uh, for their careers. Um, and, they, and they were all saying, this was so wonderful to look at my work, to see what I did well, what I didn't do well, what I can improve upon. What does this have to do with my future career? But even on a, on a, a lower level education, elementary school or high school, um, they can put together some portfolios to really look at their work. Uh, younger students can collect their work and put it together to showcase their strengths and reflect on their weaknesses. The teacher can ask, when they're deciding not to use some piece in their portfolio. Why didn't you use this? What did you think? How do you think it could be uh, corrected or made better? So um, the reflection essay for the college students has been really a good experience. Uh, these are great assessment tools. And once again, it can help them take charge of their own learning. So let me sum up uh, so we have time for questions. There are some pictures. I know we're all missing those days of being in small groups, talking, brainstorming, discussing. I had to put those pictures up just to remember. So let's use reflection to look at our lives, our backgrounds, our outlooks, and our biases. Let's use reflection to understand the system and how we can best serve our students. Let's use reflection to develop our professional methods and our character. Let's use reflection to assess our trials and our errors. Let's use reflection to help students become autonomous learners so that they and us can evaluate and respond to people and situations with empathy and flexibility. So I hope there are some questions. Please, this is the time to put your questions in the chat. And Mr. Raj will look at those questions and I will try to answer them. So, uh... I feel like I go through it a little bit fast, um, but I wanted to include, I really wanted to include going from personal reflection to classroom reflection to students reflecting because it's, it's a bra, it's going from the small picture to the big picture. And I think that's so important. You know, we are waiting for some of the questions to pop up. So the question is in the chat box, you can see in the, T.H. Lawrence is asking, could you explain default thinking under assumptions? Oh, sure. So, you know, when you're on Microsoft Work, Word or something, and it says, do you want to use this as your default um, setup or as your default printer? In other words, the, the thing that you always is your backup. Well, I'm not sure how I think about this. So, oh, yes, they've said that. Uh, let's take a common assumption. We've always done it this way, so it's the best way. That's a common assumption, right? So if I, if I don't want to critically think about something, I may think, well, 
we've always done it this way, so it must be the best way. That was default thinking. Is that clear? Now, uh, there is another question from Ian Ramani. Uh, would trying to develop one's own teaching philosophy statement help in clarifying to oneself why one does what one does? Yes, and you know, I have a, a, a template that I give my students, my pre-service teachers, to work on a teaching philosophy. And um, I'm just going to give you a uh, my language center uh, email here if you want it. But anyway, um, when you're writing your when you're writing your teaching philosophy, you're going to say, this is the result that I want. I want to uh, make <laughs> autonomous learners. So I need to do these things in order to produce that result or that outcome. Or I want my students to um, learn how to think independently in society or, or whatever the outcome is. So yes, your teaching philosophy is going to be based on your values and principles. And then you're going to write in your teaching philosophy your activities that you're doing that are going to produce those results, um, activities and uh, exercises and things like that. So I think writing a teaching philosophy is a great way to look at why you do what you do. Now, I had to do it in order to get this job. No, I actually had to do it in order to get my master's degree. So uh, it's a great exercise. And there is a template that I have that I can send you if you're interested. Now, the next question is from Dr. Anita Sharma. And her question is, how would one practice objective tone during self-reflection so that self-prejudices may be narrowed down to minimal? That's a good question, OK? Because objectivity is the first thing that we want in creative, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in critical thinking, right? We want to be objective. So. I think sometimes you have to, and I learned this from Nirja <laughs> Raghavan, that um, sometimes you have to put yourself in other people's shoes. And also another way to do that is to be a third party. So let's say there's a conflict between a student and a teacher, putting yourself in the student's shoes helps that, but also looking at it from a third party. She had us do this once in, I took a course during lockdown from Nirja, um, uh, reflective writing for teachers. And she had us be a third party. So I looked at a conflict between me and some students, tried to look at it from a third party view of me and a third party view of them. So I think you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes to help you to be objective. Sometimes you can do that by yourself. Sometimes you need to talk with others. Now, the next question is uh, uh, from uh, G. L. Nath, uh, and the question is, is reflection not possible before we plan? Is reflection not possible before we plan? Oh, of course. If reflection is possible at any time. I think that usually when I'm writing a lesson plan, I'm reflecting. So what I'm asking you to do is if you start with autobiographical inquiry and you reflect on your own values and principles, that is reflecting before planning. Uh, now for the next question, Sanjay Arora has asked this question. How can we reflect after an online class, which is more linear and has, a, has less scope of interaction? Well, that's a good question, but I still do it. Um, I, I'm always trying to think of how, how I can make sure that my students are engaged and how my students are engaged, how I can be sure that they're engaged. So I think that when you reflect after your online class, ask yourself questions like, what did I notice? For example, maybe you notice, and as I do, sometimes all I see are blocks with names, right? They're not even showing me their face. So sometimes I even in the middle of class say, I want everybody to put their video on for a minute. I need to see your faces. I'm a human being too. And I need to know that we have some kind of interaction here. So I think 
maybe sometimes we need to pause, but we need to ask um, ourselves some di maybe different questions, but we're still going to ask, okay, what did I notice? Why did I use this? And did I get the results that I wanted? So we're still going to ask ourselves questions even after online, but then we have to start being a little bit more creative because it's harder online. I know I'm doing it too. Right now I'm doing a English for employability, uh, communications and presentation skills, critical thinking and creative writing all online. And so I hear you, I feel for you. And, um, but I still am constantly reflecting and trying to just ask myself questions like, what could I do differently? How can I make it more interactive or how can I be sure that they're engaged? So. So thank you very much for that reply. Now there is another question from Jacob Shaila. Can the act of reflection be structured or designed into a system of mechanism for professional development? Yes, and there are some. I just um, found not long ago, I think it was called John's um, anyway, there was there, there are some formulas out there, but you could also do your own. And I think that we should, I think that's a great idea. How can we, what, what can we develop to make the reflection geared towards our own development? Great question. I'll take that as a challenge. So let me put my, let me put my email in here again. This is um, at St. Joseph's College, we have a language center and this is the email that won't get lost in my personal email. So email me another question or a reminder of something. Um, so I think we can take one more question. And the question is, uh, while you're sharing your email by Siva Yaramendi, why education system not changed into practical learning in India? That you, like, can you repeat that again? Uh, it is related to the new education policy, which you referred to. Uh -huh. Why education system not changed into practical learning in India? Okay, well, I haven't read the whole policy, but I'm hoping that they do go from theory to practice because we all know that we need some changes in the classroom, both urbanly in the urban areas as well as in the rural areas. So I haven't read the whole policy, but I'm really hoping that uh, there are some practical ideas and we do need to make it practical. Policies are very good at being uh, theoretical, all right? So that our job is to make it practical. So there were some really good things in the first few pages of the, the policy that we're really looking at the future. Now it's up to us to make them practical. Does that answer your question? Yes, I hope so. Shavan, sir, can we take one more question? Yes, we sure, can. Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Now, so I see somebody's asking, could we apply this reflective learning to our learners? Yes, you need to have those, those other questions that I said at the end. What did you notice? Why did the teacher use this? Um, how, how, how can I identify my mistakes? Yes, we need to, that's what I was hoping you would grasp the vision of going from our own personal reflection, reflecting on our classroom, reflecting on our system to ref having our students reflect and begin to learn how to learn. Yes. So, so did is, you have it? Yes, yes. Very, uh, there is one very important question, which has been asked by Dharmen Bhatt. How can we plan differently able for differently able learners classroom on reflective teaching strategy? How can we plan for different kinds of learners? No, differently able learners. Differently able learners. Differently able learners. Um, well, that's a pretty um, that's an important question, but it's also, you know, all of your classrooms are unique. All right. So when you're reflecting you need to think about your differently abled learners and what can you do to serve them and to to help them to learn in whatever category so that probably takes a lot of reflection i'm i'm not a special ed teacher 
but I think that as you reflect on those learners and what's working, what's not, you'll become a better special ed teacher. So uh, that uh, is the end of the question answer session. Thank you very much, Vicky, for uh, the session and answering these questions. And today, while talking about reflecting teaching practices, uh, Vicky referred to the new education, national education policy of India. And I really liked the quote of John Dewey, education is not preparation for life, education is life itself. She talked about the entire process of reflection, which is started uh, from the reference of uh, Nirja Raghavan, and uh, she talked about reflective practices helps one see one's own experience with clarity. It involves a skills like different type of skills which she referred to. And uh, there was one very important reference to autobiographical inquiry, where she suggested that uh, about the interrogation of oneself and deconstruction, the familiar things, and uh, uh, especially a poem I am from that was really touching and everyone of us can use that method and uh, I, I remember the lines uh, of our poem new beginnings new seasons new chapters unfolding from I am from then she talked about uh, assumptions and uh, she also integrated these things to critical thinking because when we talk about reflection it has to be critical and uh, she uh, talked about the aspects of deconstruction and she also talked about different kind of exercises which we can do with our colleagues and in the end she talked about critical self-reflective multiculturalism and uh, she talked about uh, the to develop a philosophy a practice which is based on the values and principles and she also uh, asked us to connect with the changing world and the society which is so important we should always uh, see that how our world is changing it was we cannot reflect without that and then once again she referred to uh, Dewey's philosophy uh, which was his belief that a democratic society of informed and engaged inquiries was the best means of promoting human interest and uh, then she appealed to all of us to uh, think about the privileged class and to accommodate the unprivileged and to understand the underpinnings so that we can be positive instruments of change and information. Overall, it was a very uh, engaging session and uh, she completed it with the, uh, this reflection of professional development model. I especially liked her trial and error methodology uh, chart in which she talked about different aspects and at the end, she talked about the students' reflection and to create portfolios to showcase their strengths and analyze their weakness. Thank you very much, Vicky, for your session. Now, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Ram Krishna Bhise, National Joint Secretary, Altai, to propose the vote of thanks. Over uh, to Dr. Ram Krishna Bhise. Yes. Uh, thank you, Raj, sir. Uh, I'm here for the vote of thanks. Uh, it is said that an ignited mind is the most powerful weapon on the earth, above the earth and under the earth. And this is got through the education. So LTI has been facilitating teacher teaching fraternity by organizing different national and international academic events. And I hope you all had a nice evening today. I, Dr. Ramkishan Bisse, on behalf of Organizing Committee of LTI Webinar Series 2020, session 19. Uh, I take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to the speakers of the day, Vicky Hale, EL Fellow, US Department of State, for her intellectual deliberations and valuable information on the topic, reflective teaching practices, self-reflection and learning spaces that she shared with us today. And the thing which I have learned from the presentation the, we don't learn from the experience, we learn from reflecting on the experience. Uh, I'm also grateful to the moderator, Mr. Rajkumar Singh, 
secretary entire lucknow chapter for doing his job wonderfully i appreciate and express my gratefulness to both the chapters entire lucknow and greater noida chapter and all their core committee and chapter members for taking a hard work to make this webinar possible uh, i am also grateful to the relo for their support and cooperation for this webinar uh last but not the least a big thank you to all the participants who are attending this webinar who have joined from the different places of nations without your support we could not have witnessed this wonderful day so last i thank you all chapter heads core committee members different committee members who helped directly and indirectly to make this webinar a grand success thank you one and all there are some instructions and announcements for the participants Uh, the feedback form will be sent through the mail, uh, and we have uh, Elta has organized some upcoming webinars. So don't forget to register and attend the upcoming student webinar series too. And the topic is writing skills: how to write an essay. Speaker is Richa Sharma, ESL and EFL specialist, and student speaker Maya Raja on 20th September 2020, Sunday at 4:30 p.m. and after that our next webinar series session 20 is on using songs and music in english classroom by john kang shin he is a phd associate professor of education from george mason university uh she is going to talk on using songs and music in english classroom so those who have attended the entire session they will get a certificate of attendance within one week and the last don't forget to like our facebook page and do subscribe the eltai youtube channel for the updates thank you thank you one and all thank you dr ram krishna bhisep and this brings us to the closure of the 19th eltai online webinar session on reflective teaching practices self reflection and learning spaces organized by the english language teachers association of india in association with the regional english language office embassy of the united states of america the event was coordinated by eltai lucknow chapter and eltai greater noida chapter thank you for joining us goodbye thank you